All right. Welcome to the next presentation in our conference, the National Security State and the Kennedy Assassination. I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, the sponsor and host of this conference. Nice to be back with y'all and thank you for attending again. Uh, as most of you know, I'm sure by now, our mission at FFF is to present a principled case for the libertarian philosophy. And as part of that mission, we make the case for a limited government republic. And in that process over the years, we have done a lot of articles, critiques on the national security state type of governmental system under which we've operated since around 1947. And part of that is examining all the horrific things that the national security establishment has done, including the Kennedy assassination. Uh, we're now on our third presentation that forms the heart of this conference, which is the medical evidence surrounding the autopsy of President Kennedy. Uh, we've already had two presentations. We've got two more, including tonight. We're very honored and pleased to have Dr. David Mantic with us this evening. Uh, Dr. Mantic is a radiation oncologist. He got his PhD in physics at the University of Wisconsin. He was serving as an assistant professor there. And then he went to medical school. He did his internship and in residency at uh, Los Angeles County USC Medical Center in Los Angeles. He's been studying the Kennedy assassination since at least the 1990s. He's one of the rare people who have been permitted to view the JFK autopsy materials at the National Archives. In fact, he spent nine days there examining the materials, especially the autopsy x-rays. Now, as you go through Dr. Mantic's talk, and as you go through the next talk next week by Dr. Gary Aguilar, Keep in mind one question uh, throughout these presentations. Is there any innocent explanation for a fraudulent autopsy? With that, Dr. Mantic, it's an honor and pleasure to have you join us. Thank you so, for doing so. Thank you, Jacob. My initial slides here refer to the comments of the prior speakers in this series. Doug Horn's final question was, if the JFK assassination was a simple murder, as the Warren Commission concluded, why was evidence suppression and alteration required? James Humes was the chief pathologist at the autopsy on November 22nd. We would ask him if a single gunman succeeded, why perform two separate brain exams? and then hide this from us. Another question or two for James Humes, if there was only one gunman, why vacillate about the skull entry site? And why lie about the location of the fragment trail on the skull x-rays? Mike Chesser, the preceding speaker noted dozens of very tiny metallic fragments that lay very near JFK's forehead on the x-rays. So why does that imply a shot from the rear? And if a snowstorm of fragments form the trail across the top of the skull on the x-rays, why does this imply a full metal jacketed Manlikur Carcano bullet? Of course, neither of these questions has a reasonable answer. Here's the puzzling autopsy photograph of the back of Kennedy's head. This is the official photograph still at the archives. 16 Parkland doctors did not recognize this photograph. So the question is obvious, is this authentic? Were all the doctors wrong? Here you see a group of four doctors placing the large hole at the back of Kennedy's head. In Robert Groton's book, you can see many more similar photographs. Michael Kurtz cites eight Bethesda doctors, these are the ones at the autopsy, who described the same posterior head wound that the Parkland doctors had seen. So we have at least two dozen doctors who must all have been wrong if you accept the official report. Daniel Ellsberg, was famous for giving the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times. Here's a quote from Daniel. 
the reality unknown to the public and to most members of Congress and to the press is that secrets that would be of the greatest import to many of them can be kept from them reliably for decades by the executive branch, even though they are known to thousands of insiders. The title of my talk is JFK, The Medical Quest. And here are the goals of this talk. First, we will imagine the multiple dilemmas faced by the autopsy pathologist on November 22nd. We will discuss their solutions. We will then ask what they did not know at the autopsy. Then we will turn to the official radiologist who later reviewed their conclusions. We will discuss how they misled us and what they missed. The Harper fragment plays a central role in this case since it came from the posterior right area of JFK's head. And I've given 15 clues for that conclusion. We will then turn to many persistent preposterous paradoxes uh, in the medical evidence in this case. And we will conclude with a summary or a, uh, with a statement of De uh, Stanley Milgram's work and discuss his book, Obedience to Authority. Of course, most importantly, we will discuss the three successful headshots as was first proposed a decade ago now by Doug Horn. I view this now as the standard model to explain what happened to JFK. We will return to this uh, in a bit. But in 1963, at the autopsy, James Humes occupied center stage. On your left is Boswell, his assistant. Both were Navy pathologists. On the right is Dr. Fink, who was borrowed from the Army that night. These photographs were taken in 1963. In 1992, the Journal of the American Medical Association published their interviews with Humes and Boswell. Things came later that year. Humes had signed on with the US Navy in 1943. So in 1963, he was completing 20 years of military service, which is a magic interval. According to an online source in 2017, US military offers very generous pension benefits after 20 years of service, members can retire with 50% of their final salary for the rest of their lives. I don't know exactly what the rules were in 1963, but I suspect Humes had a lot at stake at that time. Albert Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge for knowledge is limited to all we now know and understand. Well, imagination embraces the entire world. So imagine with me what it must have been like to be at the autopsy on November 22nd, 1963. Imagine being a pathologist at the JFK autopsy and having just been told that three shots were fired, all of them from behind. So for a few moments, let's imagine the scene as I play the role of Humes at the autopsy. I see a large hole in the right occiput. The image here was prepared for the movie JFK. Robert Groden's reconstruction is fairly accurate. This is close to what Hume saw. You can see the large hole in the right rear here, which is fairly close to what was actually uh, seen by Hume's. Now, pretending to be Humes here again, I saw the back of the head, but I did not see the red spot here. And I did not wash the hair. The large hole extended into the occiput, which is this area. As I stated, and commenting as Mantic, I, I would say you can do your own stereo viewing with these two images. You can check for yourself whether they seem authentic. Here's a common myth. 
the scalp was not being stretched over a gaping hole here. I know that from my stereo viewing at the archives. The image is not 3D as it should be. I looked at all the pairs <clears throat> of photographs at the archives and they are essentially all 3D as they should be. But only here on the back of JFK's head where the image is highly questionable, does it become 2D? And that's because the same fake image was inserted into each member of the paired photographs shown uh, just above. Look for yourself. The pathologists were unable to completely cover the defect with the scalp as they themselves admitted. Speaking as Humes, in the posterior skull, I originally identify a portion of a bullet entry hole. The black mark was placed on the skull by Humes. Here's the uh, ELP also marked with the black uh, mark there. This is the original site that Humes reported to the Warren Commission and what he started with before the uh, House Select Committee on Assassinations, which I will be calling HSCA. But before he was finished with his HSCA testimony, Humes had moved the wound all the way up to here, 10 centimeters higher or four inches. And we will come back to that issue and I hope before we conclude, you can actually see a video of Humes uh, testifying before the HSCA, during which he describes um, his thinking on this. Humes, I invented a new definition. Slightly is four inches. Humes speaking, I see the skull, the AP skull x-ray, and I would call this image on your left. The red arrow here identifies a small metallic fragment which lay at the back of the skull. This was cited uh, in their report by FBI agents Cyber and O'Neill. And I must thank uh, Phil DeGru Phil for his Photoshop work here and also Larry Rivera for his offer of assistance. Humes again, I did not see that 6.5 millimeter thing. This object was actually played as the central role in the HSCA proceedings. They decided that this was a cross section of a bullet and, the, and that this represented reality and uh, reflected where the bullet had come in on the back of the head. Unfortunately for them, Larry Sturdivant, their physics expert, claimed that this thing could not be a piece of metal. Unfortunately, however, Larry didn't tell them that. That only came up later when he was asked about it. Humes again, I see the throat wound. Near the throat, I, that's Humes, note tissue damage to the following. At the lung apex, there is a five centimeter contusion, that's two inches. And there's also um, bruising in the strap muscles of the neck. I immediately recognized that this meant trauma on Elm Street. Damage to these sites could not be caused by a tracheotomy. Dr. Perry, who did the tracheotomy at Parkland, would surely not accidentally cause a two inch contusion at the top of the lung, that's preposterous. So I promptly know during the autopsy that a projectile had passed through the throat. I did not need to speak to Dallas to learn this. Uh, my comment, Boswell later confirmed this. While at the autopsy, they knew about the throat wound. Ebersole told me the same story and his comments are on a recorded interview, which is now at the archives. Uh, my comment here again, in 1977, Boswell had an epiphany for the HSCA. The original face sheet placed the back wound here where it's marked seven by four millimeters indicating its size. But he raised this back wound into the neck as shown by the red arrow here. Gerald R. Ford, my fellow resident of Rancho Mirage, concurred with this. Even though he was not at the autopsy, Ford nevertheless claimed to know this. These are identical wounds. On the left, 
you see Rydberg's drawing for the Warren Commission circled in blue. On the right, JFK's shirt at the archives. And you can see where the uh, shirt was penetrated by something. But these are supposedly in the official conclusions, the same wound. Robert Frazier for the FBI measured both the single hole in the shirt that you see here and the single hole in the jacket as a little more than five inches below the collar. This is the photograph of the back wound. This is an official autopsy photograph still present at the National Archives. Glenn Bennett, who was in Dealey Plaza, stated, quote, I saw the shot hit the president about four inches down from the right shoulder. Does that match the Rydberg drawing? Hardly. Rydberg later expressed his regret for his misleading JFK diagrams, but the archives refused his request to view the JFK evidence, so he published his own book. Back to Hume's again. Hume's on the single bullet theory. Even though we had no CT scans, I knew that this trajectory was unlikely. On the right, you can see a cross section through the critical area of the uh, lower neck. On the low right, uh, <clears throat> the bullet enters the back about five centimeters to the right of the midline. And uh, according to the pathologist that it exited at about the midline in the throat. So there's the trajectory it should have followed, but it can't do that without crashing into bone, which is shown in white here. So the spine should have been fractured, but of course it wasn't. Hume's made that clear. If it had happened at a slightly lower level, it would have punctured the lung but that didn't happen either. We have Hume's word on that. So this is in a basically impossible trajectory. Here we have the autopsy face sheet, which was prepared that night. Uh, notice that there's a green horizontal line at the top and one at the bottom. So from this, you can tell that the, the two figures uh, should be able to be compared with respect to vertical levels. The upper red line goes through the throat wound here. The lower red line goes through the back wound. So purely based on the face sheet, Hims can say, of course, I knew that the back wound was much lower than the throat wound, which made the single bullet theory quite implausible. Weeks later, I, that's Hughes again, <clears throat> write the supplementary brain exam. Even though Boswell and I both believe that JFK's brain was buried with his body. Now, this is rather fantastic. How can they write a report on an exam of the brain that has already been buried with the body the following Monday? But that is what they said, that is what they believed. On the left is a drawing an overhead view of uh, nine photographs at the archives of the brain. The report described a laceration that went all the way from front to back shown by the yellow line. And there was essentially no damage to the left side of the brain. And you can see for yourself the damage to the right side. Um, you can see here, this is the cerebellum at the back of the head which was totally intact in this brain. Hymns can defend himself here by saying, well, I only had a limited supply of spare brains. Hymns uh, was responsible for the weekly brain cutting session. So this was right in his bailiwick. What can I say? He might reply. I did the best I could with this brain. This was the closest brain I could find to the actual damage in JFK. But he could argue that they should get credit for omitting the date. We don't know when this was done. I think the date was deliberately omitted. Back to Humes again, I describe a 4.5 centimeter deep laceration. We're talking about the distance from the vertex to the bottom of the laceration. So using 
Hume's own words and 4.5 centimeters, I've tried to place where the laceration would have been. This is my work, not Hume's work. He never did place this on a skull, but this is consistent with what he said, 4.5 centimeters from the vertex to the bottom of the laceration. Now here's the problem. Hume says, told the Warren Commission and tried to tell the HSCA that the bullet entered near the EOP. If the bullet entered here, how can all this brain between the bottom of the laceration and the EOP be intact? But that's basically what he's telling us. It makes no sense whatsoever. And Humes could very well say, I was lucky that Cornwell with the HSCA in 1977 did not nail me for this huge discrepancy between this laceration which was described in our brain report and the EOP entry. A few more comments about this lateral skull x-ray since this is the first time we've seen it. This very dark area here is very large and it's completely devoid of brain or soft tissue. The optical densities here are about the same as in the maxillary sinus. So there's nothing in this area on the skull x-rays which are taken at the autopsy. Some people have said that the black area here means that the face, the, the right face is gone and maybe the right eye is gone too, but that's not the case. We have autopsy photographs, uh, which demonstrate clearly that, that uh, JFK's right face and um, even, even the view from the anterior was essentially uh, intact. Uh, the Parkland uh, personnel agreed with that. One our other item we should note is this metal fragment trail which is uh, demonstrated by these tiny white spots all the way across the top of the skull. That trail starts right at the forehead as you heard from Mike Chesser last week. But this is the famous fragment trail, which is of course totally inconsistent with the bullet coming in here. More of this later. Humes, at the autopsy on November 22nd, we saw cerebellar damage, but the brain we examined later had an intact cerebellum. The high fragment trail on the x-rays would have meant a second headshot. So this must be one headshot here, but Hume said the bullet entered here. So he can't have it both ways. He knows that two headshots means conspiracy. So he's been backed into a corner. So the high fragment trail on the x-rays would have meant the second headshot. So we had to rewrite the autopsy report and describe the cerebellum as intact. So the photographs of the brain in the archives today do show intact cerebellum. So he was uh, going to put his money on that horse. Humes again, I am forced to obfuscate and even lie when necessary. So I've listed here Humes's response to all of the dilemmas he faced. Number one, him speaking again, I see the large occipital hole, so I obfuscate. He doesn't deny that it's there, but he really doesn't pay attention to it, nor does he describe it. Number two, on the x-rays, the fragment trail is too high. It implies another headshot. So I lie, and in the autopsy report, I describe it as 10 centimeters lower. This gets him into real trouble with the AARB in 1996. Number three, the autopsy uh, cerebellum was damaged, but it disagrees with the fake brain. So I simply ignore the cerebellum. Number four, on the x-rays, I see metallic debris near the forehead. You heard about that from Chesser last week. I also see the forehead entry wound in the skin on the photographs. So I incise the wound and I ignore the metallic debris. I see bruising in the throat tissues. I know this means trauma while JFK was still alive. So I must lie and claim that the tracheotomy hit all this damage. I had two phone calls with Dallas during the autopsy, so I lie, or else everyone would know that I knew about the frontal throat entry. I see a temporal bone entry near the right ear, so I ignore it. I correctly identify a right EOP entry at the back of the skull but I later mislocated on video for the HSCA and we'll see more of this. I had no choice. That entry had to match the high fragment trail. 
To cover my tracks, I had to write different autopsy reports at different times, especially after the exam of the fake brain. I had no choice. If this had not been JFK, Robert Carney would have performed the autopsy. Like James Jenkins, the technologist who stood at the table all night long with the pathologist, and like Dr. Robert Walker, um, bullet expert who was there, Dr. Carney also recalled a wound on the right side of the head in the temporal area, approximately above the right ear. This information from uh, about Dr. Walker came quite recently, as you see at the bottom, on May 19th in an email from Dr. Don Curtis, who was uh, very much involved in this case too. At Parkland Hospital, Charles Crenshaw saw an entry right there at the hairline. I could not locate a higher resolution image, so I copied this from my original um, 1992 VHS tape, which I had recorded live. If anyone has a better resolution image, I would love to get it. This is an artist's rendering of a photograph seen by Quentin Schwinn in Rochester, New York, the home of Eastman Kodak. Rochester was also home to Hawkeye Works, where the Zapruder film may have been modified. And now Hughes. I hope for the best. And I succeeded until the HSCA in 1977 and the ARRB in 1996. Then all hell broke loose, especially in front of the ARRB with Doug Horn. But I got to play golf in Florida for three more years until 1999, when I died of lung cancer, just like Eversol, and took all of my secrets to the Catholic corner in heaven and got to meet my fellow Catholic, JFK. But meanwhile, I kept my pension and even got a military promotion. Later, LBJ even gave me presidential cufflinks after I served as his pathologist. Humes again, the HSCA interviewed me in 1977. They wanted to know about that entry wound, so I changed my mind and pointed to the Carlick area. There he is. He moved it from here to here. After all, that's closer where the closer to where the fragment trail was. That's up here. It still doesn't really match, but it's it is closer. You can listen to this testimony on YouTube. The link is there. This encounter occurred on September 16th, 1977. I want you to remember that date uh, for a good reason, as you'll see later, September 16th. So for the HSCA then, Humes moved the entry site. There was only one, only one bullet. He moved it from here to here, 10 centimeters or four inches. Before the HSCA, during this encounter, Gary Cornwall, who was deputy chief, asked me some tough questions and he took all the credit for my four inch move. Cornwell, <clears throat> regarding the posterior skull entry, quote, do you now have a more well-considered or different opinion, end quote? Humes, quote, I think I do have a different opinion. And uh, a, a few minutes later, he adds this comment. I erroneously previously identified the entry site, end quote. Cornwell, is this four inch discrepancy explainable, end quote? Humes, I have a little trouble with that. You can also read about Cornwell's uh, recounting of these events in his book. Humes, this is my final statement to the HSCA, quote, I and my associates are quite elated, in fact, that all the substantive findings of the panel are in basic concordance with our findings. Mantic, this is my rejoinder. In other words, don't worry about four inches. The video of hymns with the HSCA will be played after my lecture, so sit tight. Humes can claim that he was blindsided. He could say, I did not know in time 
that critical autopsy photographs would be destroyed or that critical autopsy photographs would be altered or that some skull x-rays would be deliberately lost and that the three extant skull x-rays would be decisively altered. And he would be right about that. In 1992, when Humes was interviewed by the Journal of the American Medical Association, he recanted his HSCA testimony and the journal, of course, ignored his backsliding. Here's what he told the journal, quote, the fatal wound was blatantly obvious, end quote, Humes recalls. Quote again, the entrance wound was elliptical, 15 millimeters long and six millimeters wide and located 2.5 centimeters to the right and slightly above the external occipital protuberance. So my comment is Humes's four inch move for the HSCA just went up in smoke, it vanished. But Humes has some excuses. Number one, he was placed into a straitjacket. He had no choice but to write misleading autopsy reports. If he had refused, conspiracy would have been apparent to all due to the obvious frontal shocks. Number two, he inserted misleading eyewitness statements into the autopsy report. Of course, he didn't know they were misleading, but in fact, eyewitness statements are virtually never included in an autopsy report, as Dr. Cyril Wecht has advised me. Number three, he did not have JFK's clothing. Number four, he did not know about the Harper fragment, which was not even cited by the Warren Commission. He did not know that the magic bullet was bogus or that the FBI had two bullets that night, but he did know and he never told us about the two brain exams. For that, he is culpable. But Humes was a respected professional. I accept that. I don't think he was incompetent. After all, he directed the weekly brain cutting sessions at Bethesda. And Gary Cornwell in his book, Real Answers, cites the strong respect he got from the forensic pathology panel of the HSCA. We turn next to the radiologist, John Ebersol. Like me, he was actually a radiation oncologist. He recalled to me two phone calls that he uh, remembered had occurred with Dallas during the autopsy. The first one at about 10.30 at night. Uh, this conversation has been recorded and has been placed at the National Archives. You can listen to it yourself. Malcolm Perry, who did the tracheotomy at Parkland, originally also recalled two phone calls, and he initially stated that they were on November 22nd. William Manchester, who wrote The Death of a President, cites two phone calls during the autopsy. Robert Carney, who we discussed before, quote, he told the ARRB staff that he was aware of hearsay that Dr. Humes had called Dallas to talk to a surgeon later in the evening before the body left the morgue, end quote. John Ebersole also recalled for me during my phone conversations, five to six skull x-rays. There are only three in the official collection today. Gerald Custer, the technologist, also confirmed this to me. And uh, most importantly, these two gentlemen never spoke to one another after the autopsy. So there was no collusion here. Custer specifically recalled two oblique skull x-rays that no longer exist. So what about these later government experts? How did they mislead us? The HSCA forensic pathology panel trusted the photographs, some of which you have not seen, and they ignored the autopsy pathologist even when they disagreed with the photographs. But they were not told that there was no provenance for the photographs. They were not told that the camera did not match the photographs. And here's another myth. They all believed that the x-rays were as immutable as God himself. We know that's not true now. Of course, the real problem was that they had never actually worked in the dark room, so they did not know how x-ray copying was done. What about the later government radiologists? What they missed or deliberately ignored? Number one, the fragment trail is centered at the front of the skull with many tiny pieces right at the forehead, as you heard last week from Dr. Michael Chesser. I agree with that. 
This clearly implies a frontal shot. Number two, the forehead wound in the photos seems consistent with this. Number three, the magical materialization of the 6.5 millimeter object is totally absurd. Its absence on the lateral x-ray is also absurd. This is not physical reality. Number five, the missing upper temporal bone on the x-rays, we will return to this issue. The white patch, we will discuss that. There is an absence of emulsion under the T-shaped inscription, which we will also discuss. It's interesting to note that the Warren Commission did not utilize the autopsy materials. So the HSCA was really the first government investigation to include these items. Later government radiologists miss all three clues to X-ray alteration. Optical density was totally outside their worldview. No one ever mentioned that possibility. And the white patch, which we will discuss, is indeed otherworldly. The 6.5 millimeter object simply cannot materialize like a magician's rabbit between 1963 and 1967. Nobody saw it on November 22nd. No one discussed it on November 22nd. It's totally absent from the record and I suspect from the uh, original x-rays. This 6.5 millimeter, millimeter object cannot be absent from JFK's lateral x-ray, which it is. This is not physical reality. If you see something from the front, you should also be able to see it from the side on the x-ray. That's not the case here. These experts were too obtuse to look for missing emulsion under the T-shaped inscription. More about this later. Furthermore, the forehead shot was obvious. Tiny metal fragments precisely at the forehead cannot possibly imply a posterior shot. Russell Morgan was the sole radiologist for the Clark panel, which released its report in 1968 based on work they had done in 1967. Here's the newspaper article whose uh, headline says, Expert Backs Warren Report. If you read the report, it really should have said, expert questions were in report. Look at this highlight. The key questions remaining, this is Russell Morgan talking, are those of a possible conspiracy. That's hardly the Warren report. So Russell Morgan had his own groundhog here. Let's read this highlight. The fragmentation depicted in the x-ray, that's the fragment trail we've been talking about, was so severe that one had to wonder if it was a so-called dum-dum or hollow point bullet, as opposed to the kind which was found on the floor beside Conley, said Dr. Morgan. I'll show you those uh, photographs uh, a little later here. So for Russell Morgan, this was a last ditch effort to CYA. The above article appeared in the Lansing State Journal on, here's that famous date, September 16th, 1977. Do you remember that date? Humes's above testimony occurred on September 16th, 1977, the very same day that Morgan almost recounted. Was this a coincidence? It was the same day that the American public saw the skull x-rays. For the ARRB, a forensic radiologist, the so-called ultimate expert was enlisted. John Fitzpatrick, the forensic radiologist, confessed that he could not solve the paradox of the 6.5 millimeter object, but he ignored my optical density data and re in response to my letter, he offered only cliches. Instead, for the ARRB, he returned for a second day just to stare helplessly at this 6.5 millimeter fake, and he never explained it. Ironically, his expertise was in childhood brain trauma, trauma not in x-ray forgery. We turn to some other issues now. And we illustrate several persistent and preposterous paradoxes. This is not quite the perpetual Peter principle, but it's close. Number one, two FBI bullets, not one magic bullet. Number two, the lateral skull x-rays do not match the brain photographs. Number three, the lateral skull x-ray does not match the secreter frame. Two, number four, no blood is seen on the hair. You've already seen that picture. 
but the shirt is soaked. Number five, the lateral skull x-ray has no 6.5 millimeter object on it. That's physically impossible. Number six, the white patch is absent from JFK's pre-mortem x-ray. I'll show you that. And from all other human skull x-rays. Number seven, an impossible blur exists in secruder frame 232. So let's look at these. On your left is the drawing of the fake ring. That's my opinion and Doug Horns. And it was essentially the conclusion of the ARRB as well. The supplemental uh, brain exam described the longitudinal laceration, which I showed you before as a yellow line going through here. But Boswell claimed that the brain on November 22nd was so torn up it would not have shown a track. That's not quite what we see here in the drawing. On your right, we have the lateral skull x-ray again, and you can see this large black area, which is essentially devoid of brain or other tissue. Um, the yellow, uh, sorry, the blue area here is very interesting. It, it, it's a collection of amorphous debris that doesn't look like solid metal at all. It's more consistent with liquid, like mercury. At any rate, on the x-ray, this whole area has no brain. So when we look at the drawing of the brain, this whole area in yellow should show no brain, but there it is. There's intact, intact brain on the one side and nearly intact brain on the other. And of course, this paradox is the result of the fact that the two teams of forgers failed to communicate with each other. More information about the official brain report. Hume stated that the brain was not perfused we're talking about the autopsy brain and on number 22nd. That is, the preservative was not inserted into the major blood vessels. But that's a critical piece of information. Humes and Boswell implied that the brain <clears throat> was examined on the Monday after the Friday of the assassination, just several days later. That would be nowhere near long enough for the brain to have been fixed in formaldehyde. So, especially if it had not been perfused. So there's a paradox there. Uh, Dr. Fink sent a report to his superiors uh, called the Bloomberg Report, in which he stated that the brain looked different at the supplemental exam than it did at the November 22nd autopsy. Well, that's because it wasn't the same brain. Horn, quote, according to numerous medical professionals, this, we're talking about the supplemental brain exam that came later that we believe in the fake exam. This is a very well-fixed brain. It appears very gray and very firm, i.e. it's not pink at all and does not appear to be soft in any way and seems as it would appear after at least 10 to 14 days of fixation. Since Hume has directed the weekly brain cutting uh, sessions, he would have had no shortage of substitute brains to use. No one needed to volunteer for this. Missing body parts occur throughout history. Besides JFK, these luminaries are also missing body parts. Einstein, Beethoven, Galileo. Here's the moral, plan ahead and requisite scat in pace, not in pieces. More paradoxes here. On your left is the photograph you've seen before of an apparently freshly washed scalp and in the center is the very bloody shirt. So the question is, how does all this blood get from a clean scalp and brain uh, to totally bloody the back of the shirt? Something's wrong here. On your far right is the pretty frame 317, which shows the wound on the right side of JFK's cheek. How does that wound cause all this damage in the shirt? Again, something's wrong here. I suspect that this image is not honest and this image is not honest. I suspect the shirt is honest. I have examined that uh, at the archives and placed it on a model and examined exactly where the hole in the shirt lay with respect to the scapula. Here are two authentic fragments. The left one is 6.5 millimeters. 
This is an x-ray that I performed on an authentic human skull that I purchased. On that skull, I placed a cross-section of a 6.5 millimeter Manneker Carcano bullet. And this is what it should like if it were actually that size. That's not what you see on the right image of JFK. This metal fragment is authentic, but it's very, very small in comparison. So I performed an experiment in the lab, but first I took very detailed optical density measurements at the National Archives. I measured the transmission of light through selected points of JFK's x-rays, took not dozens, but hundreds, at least hundreds of measurements there. So the measurements in particular here were taken from JFK's lateral skull x-ray. Uh, the the x-rays shown here are my experimental ones. This, how, this is how a 6.5 millimeter cross-section should look on the anterior posterior x-ray. And this is how it should look on the lateral x-ray. Uh, but of course, we don't see on JFK's lateral x-ray anything like that. So I took measurements uh, right through those images on JFK's x-ray shown in the lower graph here, with solid data points. And you can see as we traverse through the metal fragment on the lateral x-ray, there's only a very slight change in optical density because this thing is so small. But on the experimental one, the one that I produced here, there's a big change in optical density and that's consistent with, with what you see with your naked eye. So in other words, these two graphs are totally inconsistent with each other. I should emphasize that I took 10 data points per millimeter. So this was a fairly tedious and a, a tedious measurement and took a precise localization of uh, each successive data point. All of my JFK data were taken at the archives from the extant x-rays. My peer-reviewed article can be found online by simply typing JFK 6.5 saga. Greg Henkelman, MD, was a physics major and is now a radiation oncologist in practice for 30 plus years. Uh, Greg saw my optical density data and he wrote this review on Amazon. Dr. Mantic's optical density analysis is the single most important piece of scientific evidence in the JFK assassination. Unlike other evidence, Optical density data are as theory-free as possible, as this data deals only with physical measurements. To reject alteration of the JFK skull x-rays is to reject basic physics and radiology. Dr. Mantic has a PhD in physics and has practiced radiation oncology for nearly 40 years. He is thus eminently qualified in both physics and radiology. We turn next to the Zapruder film. The link shown here is definitely worth watching. You should uh, watch and listen as Dino Brugioni disagrees with the extant Zapruder film. He had actually seen this on the weekend of the assassination. And Dino Brugioni was a photo expert, as you can see. He wrote this book titled Photo Bakery, and there's his name. Dino Brugioni was such an expert that he interpreted the images of the Cuban missiles for JFK. Uh, just for fun, I put up another book here, The Commissar Vanishes. This is a wonderful humorous collection, all historically accurate, of how images were altered for the USSR. Now, this image is probably the most profound and troubling paradox in all the medical evidence. I first uh, discussed this issue in the 1990s after I got involved in this case. And this image was prepared by David Josephs and really illustrates the point well. In the left upper corner here, you see Zapruder frame 312. This is presum presumably the instant that the, uh, the head is struck by a bullet. According to the official story, there's only one bullet, so there's only one strike. You'll notice that JFK is leaning quite far forward. So what David did, 
was to superimpose the lateral skull X-ray on JFK's head. So we should really be able to tell here exactly how the bullet trajectory went through JFK's head shown in uh, black here, black arrow. And again, you see the fragment trail at the top now black instead of white. But if this is how the bullet struck the skull and traversed the entire width of the skull, where was the shooter? He must have been high above Dealey Plaza, maybe hovering in a hot air balloon. Or else, if the shot was fired from the front, he must have been on the limousine floor behind Connolly, right at the feet of JFK firing up. But of course, none of this makes any sense. Another paradox is the white patch, which magically appears. This is JFK's pre-mortem X-ray of 1960, just three years before he died. There's no white patch here. Whereas it's clearly seen here in the print. I want to also uh, emphasize that the petrous bone is shown here. It surrounds the ear canal and it is the densest bone in the human body. We will come back to that in a bit. But it's even worse than the absence of the white patch on the pre-mortem x-ray. Given the white patch on the post-mortem x-ray, there is no corresponding dense object anywhere on the frontal AP x-ray. If you see something that's that dense, that, that's so physically real on the lateral x-ray, goodness, you must be able to see the same object on a frontal view. Things don't just disappear because you move your x-ray machine around. In the real, real world, there must be something equally dense seen on the AP x-ray, but there isn't, there's nothing there. The first public account of this paradox was given at the New York City press conference on November 10th, 1993. So from the press conference in Manhattan, I made this statement, quote, such an extremely dense object should have been as visible as a T-Rex in downtown Manhattan that day, but there was no T-Rex. But we have data too. My conclusion was that the white patch looked almost as dense as that petrous bone. And the petrous bone was of course the densest bone in the human body. So if the white patch was almost as dense as the petrous bone, it would mean that JFK's skull was almost solid bone in the white patch from left to right. That would make him the first bonehead president. But we have actual numbers to work with. We compared the optical density of the petrous bone to the white patch or the parietal area. Uh, a, a number of one here would mean that the white patch was as dense as the petrous bone. It's not quite that, but it's close. You see the number is 0.89. So it's, the white patch is a little less dense than the petrous bone using all the measurements I took, which were quite a few. The same calculation on the pre-mortem X-ray, however, gives you quite a different number. The white patch is not there. It looks normal. So the number is 0.43. And then I looked at a lot of different patients on X-rays that I had in my clinic. And of course they were about the same as JFK's pre-mortem. There's no human patient that's a bonehead all the way through the skull at that point. And JFK certainly was not. Here are the actual data. Uh, on, the, on your left is the pre-mortem X-ray, which was taken in August, 1960. Um, Mike Chesser <coughs> traveled to the JFK library in Boston and took this data in 2015. His numbers are in blue on this X-ray. On the right is the JFK post-mortem again. Um, my data from that uh, visit is shown in red, but uh, superimposed on the left image. We'll take a close look at that. Here's a magnified view. Here is the petrous bone again, surrounding the ear. And you can see my measurements in the white patch are 0 0.61, 0 0.610, 0 0.55, 0 0.64, which are not too different from the petrous bone at 0.55. Of course, I'm only showing you a few measurements here. There were lots more.
So uh, from these numbers, we can say that these are almost the same. It's just a little less dense here. So the ratio is a little less than one. Now let's look at Chesser's numbers uh, taken from the pre-mortem uh, X-ray. And here you go, 0 0.64, 0 0.53, 0 0.54, 0 0.72, and so on. Uh, in other words, his numbers in this area are pretty close to what I measured on the postmortem x-ray. But here's the critical point. In the petrous bone area, his numbers are much different from the postmortem, 0 0.3, 0 0.29, 0 0.28. In other words, the white patch does not exist. This is a normal set of numbers for the parietal area where the white patch is. And the ratio, therefore, is obviously very different. That the white patch was indeed not on the original x-rays is consistent with Humes's weird reaction to these x-rays during his AORB deposition. Quote, I don't understand why that is. You'd have to have some radiologist tell me about that. I can't make that out. I don't understand this great void there. I don't know what that's all about. How is it possible, end quote, I should say, how is it possible for Humes to react to that way, that way when he'd already seen the x-rays? Well. It's because these are not exactly the x-rays he saw. And here the magic rabbit appears. The 6.5 millimeter object pops up. Well, I was at the archives. <clears throat> I looked very closely inside the borders of this object. And on the next slide, you will see my drawing of what I saw. So here's the 6.5 millimeter object, obviously greatly magnified. On your left, I saw a, an authentic a piece of metal with the sizes as shown. The borders lined up really well with the 6.5 millimeter object, but I saw something really inexplicable as well. I saw a piece of metal, this tiny piece of metal shown with the red arrow, right in the middle of nothing. But this is inside the 6.5 millimeter object. This is a double exposure. You can read about double exposures in Fielding's uh, textbook, Special Effects Cinematography. And here's an image from that book. The 6.5 millimeter object is a result of a double exposure in the dark room. Why could I see a double exposure that no other radiologist could see? Ironically, because I was nearly blind. High myopia is like wearing a low power microscope. Here's my prescription uh, in 1982, showing my minus 8.75 diopters in one eye and minus seven in the other. High my myopia, that is minus five or worse, afflicts only 4% of the US population. You can look it up. But I had severe myopia. I wasn't minus five. One of my eyes was minus 8.75. And only about one out of 100 Americans is that bad. How many government radiologists had severe myopia? So having uh, recognized that this was a double exposure, I showed how easily it could have been done in 1963. Here's a bird brain, as I call it, a pteranodon inside the skull. And here's a scissors in black. And this was a double exposure, letting light through this shape. This was a double exposure, blocking light from this shape. So I made this template, just cut out of this piece of cardboard. And I took a photograph through it to show you that it was really an opening. You can judge for yourself the size based on the key here. So compare the shape of my cutout here to the shape of the pteranodon. That's what I used. Larry Sturdivant was the HSCA expert in physics. And here's what he said about the 6.5 millimeter object in his book, JFK Myths. As radiologist David Nanty points out, there is no corresponding density on the lateral X-ray, end quote. Quote, the apparently metallic fragment 
was just as mysterious as when we went in to the archives. So this is his comment after examining the x-rays at the archives. In a previous email, uh, Larry had declared that this object could not represent an authentic metal fragment. He'd never seen a cross section of a bullet deposited on the back of a skull and its other features were totally unworldly. There are only three skull x-rays remaining in the archives. All three are copies. Each one has been altered. The left lateral has a T-shaped inscription, which we will shortly discuss. Both laterals have a white patch, which was not on the original x-ray. The AP skull x-ray has this fake 6.5 millimeter fragment, which of course was not on the original x-ray. So let's talk about this T-shaped inscription for a bit. I cannot show you JFK's x-ray because it's not in the public domain, but I have examined it carefully. On JFK's x-ray, there is a T-shaped inscription like this. Um, I don't know why that's there or who did that. There's no discussion anywhere in the record of that, but that's all irrelevant. We want to talk instead about the physical features of that object. Uh, this could only have been placed on the x-ray film by removing the emulsion so that more light gets through and you can see the T-shaped object. So somebody scraped off emulsion on at least one side of the film, possibly using their fingernails or more likely a tool, perhaps a metal tool. So when you look at the original x-ray, you should easily be able to see where the emulsion is missing. I have performed this experiment with lots of folks and everybody finds it very easy to see the missing emulsion. So <clears throat> my conclusion was that this was not a smoking gun, but rather a la Moses. It's, this is a burning bush. This is serious stuff. The original film must show missing emulsion under the teeth. So Steve Tilly removed the film from its transparent envelope and I viewed each side separately under many angles of illumination. No emulsion was missing on either side. Conclusion, this can only be a copy film, which opens the door wide to alteration. A copy film, of course, would faithfully reproduce the T-shaped inscription, but the copy film was not physically molested, so it retained all of the emulsion on both sides. That's what I saw emulsion on both sides. And the question is obvious, where's the original film? Here's another paradox. Uh, this is Costello's impossible blur in frame Zapruder 232. Uh, you can watch the animation at the link here, or you can read his discussion on page 183. This frame was published within the first week of uh, the first week after the assassination in Life's Memorial Edition, which I retrieved from my mother. Costello notes that the blurring of the background and the blurring on the limousine due to motion must add to a specific number, and but they don't. They don't. This can only mean film alteration or else a violation of the laws of physics. Here's a copy of Life's Memorial Edition. Let me read the last part of this article to you. From the window of the building, Lee Harvey Oswald, aiming his carbine, tracked the presidential car in the crosshairs of his telescopic sight. Then Oswald fired three times. Well, obviously we didn't need the Warren Commission. That was just a lot of extra time and expense. Life magazine already had solved the case. Meanwhile, at the FBI, what about that magic bullet? Or was it two bullets at the FBI? At 7.30 that night, Richard Johnson delivers a bullet to Chief Rowley at 7.30. You can see the time uh, as it was stated uh, down here by the red arrow. At the White House, let me back up. You can see that the evidence was received from Special Agent Elmer Lee Todd. At the White House, the same man, Elmer Lee Todd, receives a bullet at 8.50 from Chief Rowley. 
and he, that's Elmer Lee Todd, places his initials on the bullet. And here's the time at the Red Arrow, received from Chief Rowley by Elmer Lee Todd, and there's Todd's initials uh, and name. So this sequence of events reminded me of that wonderful Abbott and, and Costello sketch of who's on first, which you can check out at the link. Fraser says the bullet arrived at 7.30 p.m. Todd took possession of a bullet at the White House at 8.50 p.m. How could Fraser receive a bullet in the lab from Todd at 7.30 p.m. if Todd did not have a bullet until 8.50 p.m.? Fraser acknowledged receiving the Todd bullet by putting his personal mark, that's RF, on the 8.50 p.m. Todd envelope. John Hunt's article is titled The Mystery of the 7.30 Bullet. And these are statements from John. CE399, that's the magic bullet, cannot be the same bullet that Todd handled on November 22nd. So a second bullet was delivered to the FBI lab. And John Hunt concludes as follows, quote, the historic CE399 bullet, that's the magic bullet, introduced into evidence before the Warren Commission is not the same bullet that Todd handled on the day of the assassination. End quote. And another quote, unfortunately, whatever bullet Todd actually handled that day has apparently been lost to history, end quote. And you can check out the link. Elmer, Leeds, Elmer Lee Todd's initials are not on the magic bullet. They should be. This archives photograph was labeled by John Hunt. And you can see the initials of the men at the bottom. At the archives in June 1994, while viewing the actual bullet, David Mantic and astronomer Steve Majeski, also an expert in optical density, confirmed that Todd's initials were missing. Here's another paradox. This incision was not seen in Dallas, so who did this? Supposedly, all autopsy photographs were taken before any autopsy work was done at Bethesda, but this was not seen in Dallas. How did that get there? This is what Boswell told the AORB, and the link is shown there. There was an incised wound up there that extended into the right eye socket and then back across his temporal and frontal bone, end quote. My comment, Scalpels cause incisions, but bullets cause wounds. Boswell said this was a wound. And then we have the paradox of the two limousine fragments shown here. These are the supposed nose here on the left and tail on the right of the Warren Commission's head bullet. Remember, there's only one bullet that hit the head in the official view. At any rate, such were the conclusions of Robert Fraser, the Warren Commission ballistics expert. The reader can decide exactly where to insert the 6.5 millimeter object between these two metal fragments, which is what the Warren Commission claimed. The Warren Commission wisely refrained from this wacky exercise. Here's another paradox. In Chester's talk last week, he noted that there was missing temporal bone shown here in pink. Missing temporal bone was also confirmed by Dr. McDonald for the HSCA. Here's his quote. Nearly complete loss of parietal bone, the upper portion of the temporal bone and a portion of the posterior aspect of the right frontal bone, end quote. So I placed three trajectories on the skull here. The upper one in blue is basically the HSCA trajectory. You recognize the site where Humes moved the, the entry wound by 10 centimeters. But you see that this trajectory totally misses the temporal bone. This trajectory cannot cause missing temporal bone. My friend Tink Thompson has just published Last Second in Dallas and he accepts this blue trajectory as the one. So be wary of 
Thompson's view of the medical evidence in his new book. There are many problems with it. Now the red trajectory would fit more closely with Hume's original ELP entry site. And you can see that it does have a pretty good chance of knocking out some of the temporal bone. But the one I like best is the purple one because this is consistent with uh, the entry reported by uh, many witnesses, including several at the autopsy. A bullet entered uh, slightly above and in front of the right ear. Here, here's the ear canal circled in yellow. So even witnesses in uh, Dealey Plaza noted this. And uh, it's consistent with also, also with uh, Dr. Kim Clark, the neurosurgeon who described this wound. So it was an oblique shot, probably fired from a grassy knoll, entering the temp temporal uh, bone here and exiting, this is the key part, exiting right where there's bone missing on the skull that everyone noticed. So this is a highly likely trajectory. The temporal bone inside the skull extends from one side to the other. Billy Harper that weekend uh, found a bone fragment, a fresh bone fragment in Dealey Plaza. This is a map of Dealey Plaza. This is Elm Street. And you can see in red here where JFK was at Zapruder frame 313. Now, Billy Harper said he found the bone fragment here. I, I suspect this is not actually where it landed. I, I'm quite convinced that somebody must have moved it. So Billy Harper was a pre-med student whose uncle was a pathologist in Dallas. So Billy carries the bone fragment to his pathologist uncle and three pathologists at the hospital, Methodist Hospital, examine this bone and they all declare that this is occipital bone. This is my reconstruction of the Harper fragment in the occipital area. What's amazing about this is that there was a metallic smear on one corner right there. And if you remember what Hume said about the EOP wound, it was 2.5 centimeters to the right of the EOP and slightly above the EOP. Oh my gosh, that's what I just showed you here. This Harper fragment perfectly matches Hume's description. Here's the photograph of the Harper fragment at the uh, FBI. By the way, this is a much higher resolution photograph than the one that Thompson just published in last second in Dallas. So look at this one instead of his. Here's the Harper x-ray by the FBI. This was not published in the Tink's book. You can see that there is indeed metal right here. If we compare the photograph where the smear was located on the outside to the x-ray, you can see that it's the same place. In other words, what the eye is seeing here is definitely a small bit of metal as shown by the x-ray. Now the metallic smear is on the outside of the bone. This clearly implies a bullet entry. A parietal site for the Harper fragment, which a lot of people like to think of, implies a bullet entry near the top of the head. That's, this is not the colic area. This is at the vertex, quite some distance from the colic area. But if the smear is on the outside, how does a bullet enter the top of the head? This makes no sense. Parietal supporters never explain how this is possible. Just try asking them. Well, if a bullet entered at Hume's EOP site, then everything fits. The smear is naturally on the outside. We turn next to photograph F8, the mystery photograph. You can see a large defect here. So we can readily suspect that this is the big hole that everyone saw. I've listed 15 clues to its occipital origin. That's too much for us today. We can, however, say a few things about it. The three Dallas pathologists thought it was occipital. John Ebersol told me there was a big hole in the right occiput and he saw the x-rays. So he was convinced there was a big hole at the right rear. 
many Parkland medical witnesses. Saw a big hole there. You saw some photographs of them earlier. Eight Bethesda MDs agreed. Sarah Bellum was seen as traumatized at Parkland Hospital by doctors like Robert McClelland. That's consistent with a low rear entry. The autopsy report actually describes the hole that's going into the occiput. Then there's Boswell's sketch and a statement. These are totally consistent with the big hole in the right rear. Metallic smear was on the outside. And we want to look at the mystery photograph a little more closely and some optical density data. While at the archives <laughs> via the stereoscope, I saw fat pads about here in photo F8. You see this photo is cut off. It doesn't give you the full view that you get at the archives. The fat pads that I saw there were confirmed by Kirshner for the ARRB and now also by Dr. Chesser. If we can see fat pads here, then we must be looking from the rear down toward the abdomen and toward JFK's feet, which must be down here somewhere. So this is totally consistent with this photograph being taken from the rear, and this would be the large hole. When I was there, I even saw a nipple protruding from the chest while stereo viewing. This is my placement of the Harper fragment into that photograph. In fact, you can see on the AP X-ray almost exactly where there are black areas that represent where the Harper fragment was absent. So this reconstruction is based on a lot more than just this picture, but to a large extent on the uh, AP X-ray as well. The original autopsy catalog description of, a, of F8 describes it as a posterior skull view. So while at the archives, I took lots of optical density measurements, as you can see here, and we're going to focus in the next slide on the numbers just inferior to this red fragment. This is a small fragment that was authentic at the back of the skull. So here's a close-up view. In this area, the numbers are roughly the same. This is a fairly smooth or level plateau, but the numbers are much higher than the numbers here, as you can see for yourself. The higher numbers mean missing bone. So here we have a relatively level plateau at one level, and here we have <clears throat> another plateau which is consistent with a lot of missing bone exactly in this area, just below that metal fragment. I, I should add that I, I took these optical density measurements on three different days. This is only one day's viewing, so there's lots of data here that I'm not showing you. Cerebellum was visible via the hyperfragment hole at Parkland Hospital, and that makes sense. This is about where the hyperfragment came from on this view. And you can see, especially if brain were missing, it would have been fairly easy for them to see cerebellum. Here's the dilemma faced by the HSCA, though. The HSCA could not admit to a traumatized cerebellum. As McClelland and many others at Parkland had recalled seeing. That is because the brain photo showed an intact cerebellum. So the entry wound absolutely had to be elevated to the red spot, the one that Humes did not recognize. So all the witnesses to the big posterior hole, including dozens of doctors, had to be discredited. Back to John Ebersol, the autopsy radiologist, he told me on recording that there was a big occipital hole. He told the HSCA in 1978 that the wound was occipital. During the autopsy, a large bone fragment arrived and Ebersol concluded that it must have come from the occiput. So obviously he knew that there was occipital bone missing. He was wrong about that fitting in there, but it, it clearly shows his knowledge of a big hole there. On the x-rays, unlike the Clark family, he saw no large metallic fragment but he stopped talking to me when I asked him about the 6.5 millimeter object. Here are the paired images from Groden's book. These are not identical, they're slightly different so that you can use a stereoscope 
and judge for yourself whether the view is two-dimensional or three-dimensional. Here's Robert Grodin's book, which is full of wonderful pictures. Now we have to talk about the three successful headshots a bit more as first proposed a decade ago by Doug Horn. We basically accept a bullet entry near the ELP consistent with what Humes and his colleagues said. They never really backed away from that except for Humes testimony before the HSC. Then the bullet trail in the, or the fragment trail in the x-rays must be due to a bullet entering at the red arrow. That's very hard to avoid. And then we have the temporal bone entry, which is quite distinct. And that one likely caused the blowout at the back of the head. So if you want to get into detail, you can read my ebook and uh, go through this table carefully for yourself. Now in the fragment trail on the x-rays, the lateral x-ray, the trail stops well, be, well short of the posterior skull. Because the fragment trail does not leave the skull, it cannot explain the occipital hole, but a temporal shot explains the hole. Also note that this trail of bullet fragments begins in the forehead. It does not begin in the temporal area. And here's my survey of all metallic fragments on both the AP and lateral x-rays as I performed it at the archives. Uh, this is as accurate as I could make it <clears throat> with the sizes of these objects to roughly reflecting the sizes of reality on the x-rays. This is the uh, site that Chesser spoke about with many tiny metallic fragments located near the forehead. And this is an interesting site here of amorphous debris. It looks more like liquid than metal. More myths. The white patch does not cover the occipital hole. The hole in the occipital bone lies too far posterior for that. Also, the fragment trail does not lead to the white patch. They have no relationship. Did a mercury bullet strike JFK's forehead? The day of the jackal, by Frederick Forsyth <clears throat> has a scenario where a mercury bullet was constructed to assassinate de Gaulle in 1963. Of course, that didn't happen. For soft metal bullet results, you can follow these two links. Now, evidence for a JFK mercury bullet on the x-rays is as follows. There are multiple round fragments with fuzzy borders. The roundness is a strong clue. The borders are unlike the distinct borders of the known metallic debris on the same x-ray. There are many, many very tiny fragments near the forehead reported by Chesser. The limited range of all these fragments is also consistent with a mercury bullet. The amorphous debris is very atypical of solid metal. The tiny fragments are widely scattered. They're even seen on the left side. The marked head explosion and the skull devastation do not fit a full metal jacketed bullet as Russell Morgan had feared. Let's think of some more myths here. Daniel Kahneman won a Nobel Prize for his work in psychology. And much of his work is discussed and illustrated in thinking fast and thinking slow. Official myth number one, the shots that killed JFK were fired from the sixth floor. Kahneman. Quote, a reliable way to make people believe in falsehoods, falsehoods is frequent repetition because familiarity is not easily distinguished from truth, end quote. Official myth number two, a bullet struck the back of JFK's neck and exited his throat. As an aside, Randy Robertson and Don Thomas each support their own variant of the single bullet theory. Kahneman, quote, it is the consistency of the information that matters, not its completeness. Indeed, you will often find that knowing little makes it easier to fit everything you know into a coherent pattern." End quote. Official myth number three, three shots were fired. Kahneman, quote, the confidence we have in our beliefs depends mostly on the quality of the story we can tell even if we see very little. We often fail to allow for the possibility that critical evidence is missing. 
what we see is all there is, end quote. Official myth number four, all the shots were fired by Lee Harvey Oswald. Kahneman, quote, they didn't want more information. After all, it might spoil their story, end quote. Here's my summary. The medical quest is over. We now understand the paradoxes. Daniel Kahneman was right. For the media, a good story is all that matters. Someone, perhaps Humes, removed bullet fragments from one or two bullets. Someone, likely Ebersol, doctored the x-rays. There were three headshots, forehead, right temple, and BOP. The forehead shot cannot explain the occipital hole. The temple shot cannot explain the fragment trail. It was sheer madness for the HSCA to elevate the rear shot by four inches and to accept the 6.5 millimeter fake as authentic and build their case on that. Finally, do not trust government committees. My nine visits to the National Archives have shown here. In 2018, I asked to return again, especially to inspect all those fine tiny fragments near the forehead that Chester reported, and I was banished forever by Senator Paul Kirk. Dr. Chester has likewise now also been banned. In conclusion, in 1963, Stanley Milgram showed how willingly humans follow orders from authority figures. My goodness, have we seen that during COVID. James J. Humes, the chief pathologist, had a double dose of subjugation, one from the military for 20 years, and another from the Catholic Church, which he attended promptly after the autopsy. He did not even go home to sleep. From the dust cover, Stanley Milgram's experiments in, on obedience to malevolent authority seem to me to be the most important social psychological research done in this generation. This is from Roger Brown at Harvard University. Does Doug Horn have connections in Ohio? This is my recent rental car plate in Ohio, but he got the year wrong. After all, JFK, like my mother, was born in 1917, not 1901. 1917, of course, was also the famous year when Lenin entered Petrograd. Multiple sniper teams were isolated from one another. According to John West, the most important aspect was using contract killers i.e. sniper teams with deniable connections. They included the Corsican mob, the American mafia, Cuban exiles, and domestic triggermen. These teams were compartmentalized, probably not in sync with each other, which compromised the operation. This is written by a professional sniper. After World War II, Hitler's top commando, Otto Skorzeny, built his global assassination headquarters in Madrid, near Eva Gardner and Juan Perón. Major Gannis, who I have met and who my daughter has videotaped, describes the possible connections between William King Harvey, James Angleton, both CIA, and QJ Wynn. Curiously, Ike is said to have kept Otto's photo in the White House. Otto may have directed one of the teams in Dealey Plaza. The Parkland Doctors documentary was screened at Oswald's mock trial. You should purchase this if you don't have it and watch it carefully. Here's a short list of believers in the JFK conspiracy, LBJ, Nixon, Connolly, Hoover, Clyde Tolson, Associate Director of the FBI, Carpenter the Loach, Assistant Director of the FBI, William Sullivan, FBI Domestic Intelligence Chief, John McCone, Director of the CIA, David Atley, Phillips, CIA Disinformation Specialist, and so on. From the homeland of Brave New World, the Daily Mail, on November 22nd last year, more than a quarter of UK students self-censor their opinions because they fear their universities will cancel culture and 40% are afraid their careers will be ruined if they speak out. Humes would have understood this. Abraham Lincoln, America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedoms, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. For beginners, I suggest starting here. This article is also at my website, Thematic View. And my ebook is on Amazon. So that concludes my talk. And we hope next to view video of Humes before the House Select Committee in 1977.
Correct. That's correct. And in addition, there was a hand. David, I can hear it in the background, but you haven't shared your screen yet. Are you able to do that? Uh, say that again. Said so you're not. Uh, we we can hear it in the background, but you haven't shared your screen yet. Are you able to do that? Uh, you'll have to tell me how to do that again. I don't see any obvious access on my screen. Okay, you need to get back to Zoom, and then hit Share Screen at the bottom again, and how do then I get back? select how do I get the video. Back to Zoom? You're going too fast. How do I get back to Zoom? Uh, you can click on the the uh, Zoom icon. Uh, so you should be able to see that. No such, no such. Uh, All right. Are you running there. on a Mac or a PC? PC. PC. Uh, da, 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 da. So you don't have it. Um, let's see here. It's been so long since I've used a PC. Uh, I tell you what, I think I can play that video for you. Would you like me to play that video? Well, since we seem to be at a dead end here, I suppose so. I was going to play a little more than uh, you and I had talked about, but since I can't access that. Well, I have it queued you. up at 1620, so. So I think uh, we'll have to do that. Perhaps we can put more of it on your site later then, but go ahead with that. Right, well, where do you want me to queue it up at? Well, um, if you have that option, I would start at 5922. 5922. 5922. This only goes from 16 minutes and 19 seconds. So oh, I know what. You have a different length video than I have, so I cannot give you a number. Okay. I have well, then I'll go ahead and play it as a uh, starting here to if 20 you, minutes. If you if you want to back up another three minutes or so, that would be better than where where I previously told you. Right in here. Oh, I see this image now, yes. All right. So you had me end this at 20 minutes before, so that's where I'll end it this time. All right, uh, I'm gonna, I'll start this at 13, 14. Yeah, go ahead. I'd like to see this too, but I don't know if I can. Do you have sound? I don't. All right, I'm not hearing anything. All right, let's see here, hold on. Sense of opportunity that various panels of very well-qualified forensic pathologists have had to go over them. We, we did a reasonably accurate job in the catalog, uh, cataloging these uh, photographs. So that uh, I saw them on that occasion. I saw them again on the 27th of January of 1967, when we again went to the archives and, and made some summaries of our findings. I go back further uh, to the original autopsy report, which we rendered uh, in the absence of any photographs, of course. And we made certain physical observations and measurements of these wounds. Uh, I state now that those measurements that we recorded then were accurate, the best of our ability to discern what we had before our eyes. We described the wound of entrance in the posterior scalp as being above and to the right of the external occipital protuberance, a bony knob on the back of the head you've heard Dr. Baden, the committee members have heard him describe today. And it's obvious to me, as I sit here now with this uh, markedly enlarged uh, drawing from the photograph, that the upper uh, defect to which you pointed, or the upper object, is clearly in the location of where we said approximately it was, above the external occipital protuberance. Therefore, I believe that that is the wound of entry. Its relative position to bony structures underneath is somewhat altered by the fact that there were fractures of the skull under this, and the president's head had to be held in this position with making some distortion of, of uh, anatomic uh, structures to, pr to get, produce this picture. By the same token, the object in the lower portion, which I apparently, and I believe now erroneously, previously identified before the most recent panel, 
is uh, far below the external occipital protuberance and would not fit with the original uh, autopsy findings. I'd like to show you, in addition to the photograph or the uh, drawing which is now on the easel, what has previously been admitted as exhibits 52 and 53, and also what has previously been discussed as exhibit 302. I don't believe, Mr. Chairman, that exhibit 302 was previously admitted into evidence, and if it was not, I would ask that it be admitted at this time. Without objection, it may be entered into the evidence at this point. First, Dr. Humes, with respect to the x-rays, have you also today had an opportunity to look at those x-rays? Uh, yes, sir. I would ask you if you would mind stepping to the easel and describing for us what your view or your opinion would be as to the location of the entry wound on that x-ray. Okay. I believe, and particularly in this rather enhanced uh, picture, I might say, it's a pleasure to have such because I didn't have anything of this kind uh, formerly, that this would be the point of entrance. For the record, simply, would you try to describe the point that you just indicated? Well, this, in this approximate area would be about where the external occipital protuberance would be, the knob we can feel in the back of our head. This would be above it. There's a great enlargement here, uh, so it <coughs> looks considerably further away than it would be on a standard size film or on, the, <coughs> or on the skull, and I believe that this is above the external occipital protuberance. I think it also shows on a film that Dr. Uh, Baden was showing earlier, I think it shows even better in the AP view of the, the anteroposterior view of the skull. All right, so then you would in, in effect agree with the testimony of Dr. Baden that the entry wound on the x-rays is at the point in which there is a, simply from a novice's point of view, a, a dislocation or a, yeah, a, a jutting out. Fracture line, it's a, point, it's a fracture line that juts out from that, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, if I might, Add, and more importantly, I had the opportunity, which none of the gentlemen had to do, to examine the president's skull from the inside when the brain was removed in great, with great care. There was one and only one wound of entrance. I think we're in a somewhat of a semantic uh, discussion as to where it was. And would you agree that the fragments shown in the upper portion of the skull would also be relatively consistent with that same uh, entry location on the oh, yes. skull. However, this bullet was so disrupted, those fragments, I think, could be virtually any place. And referring to exhibit 302, Which is? The, the one on the very left, the yes. uh, drawing of the brain, yes. would you also agree that the disruption of the brain as shown in that drawing is also in the upper portion and therefore would also be roughly consistent with that same entry yes, location.
All right, we're back live. Can you hear me, David? Yes, you're coming through fine. Okay, thank you very much for that excellent presentation. Um, let's now move into Q&A. Uh, first question is, does the massive staining on the rear of the shirt indicate anything about the wound? No, very little. This was a massive wound to the skull and brain. And so he bled out huge amounts of blood. And if, if you agree with me that there was a big hole in the right rear of the head, it would have had easy access to the shirt and the back. But it doesn't tell us very much more about location than that. <clears throat> okay, next question. Jenkins said that there was bruising of the lung but that it was the middle lobe, not the top of the lung. So when yes, you first did. tell us who Jenkins is, and then you can Jenkins was, a, Jenkins was a technologist who assisted the pathologist at the table all night long. And he does recall such bruising near the middle of the lung, but there's no hole in any of the clothing of JFK to be consistent with that. So I can only conclude that his memory is wrong. There was bruising at the top of the right lung that the pathologist reported. And uh, that, that's all I think there really was. Okay. Uh, did the autopsy describe the fragment lower than depicted in the x-rays? The fragment trail? I guess that's what he means, yeah. Yes, of course. Humes was trying to confine himself to one shot. So he had to move that fragment trail in his autopsy report by 10 centimeters down to match his EOP entry. So basically he lied about that. Okay, next question. What exactly was the object described in the Seibert and O'Neill's report? Those were the two FBI agents at the autopsy. They described a small metal fragment at the back of the skull, which was never put into evidence. I don't believe it was uh, taken out as a specimen that night. It was very small, as you could see from that first x-ray I showed. Uh, but I think that the fact that they mentioned it is consistent with the small fragment you see on the lateral x-ray. OK, next one doesn't seem to be a question. It says, here's a partial testimony from Dr. Humes to the AARB in 1996, changing his position from the House Select Committee and reaffirming his original Warren Commission testimony that the entrance wound was near the EOP and not four inches higher. And he's got a long quote. Um, so I don't think I need to read that. It doesn't seem to be a question. Unless you yeah, I think the only time that Humes changed his testimony was in the video that you just showed for the HSCA. Otherwise, he and his colleagues always insisted on the very much lower EOP entry. Okay, well, let me read the quote as he has it. I most firmly believe that the location of the wound was exactly where I measured it to be in relation to the external occipital protuberance and so recorded it in the autopsy report. After all, that was my direct observation in the morgue and I believe it to be far more reliable than attempting to interpret what I believe to be a photograph which is subject to various interpretations. Okay, uh, this question, has the suit jacket been preserved to compare with the bullet hole in the shirt? Well, yeah, the, as Robert Fraser said, the hole in the uh, jacket was a little over five inches down from the collar. And he said the same thing about the shirt. Was there more to the question? No. Uh, next question, isn't Joseph's drawing more like the incorrect Warren Commission picture? The head seems bent too far forward. Well, we're only assuming that the Zapruder frame 317 is authentic and assuming that the X-ray of the lateral skull is authentic and we're comparing the two and they don't match. There's something wrong. Okay, next question. What does the T-shape mean? Well, as I said in my talk, we don't know what it means or who did it. And that's not relevant. What is relevant are the uh, physical characteristics of that T-shaped inscription. The missing emulsion is the chief finding. There has to be missing visible emulsion, a, vi a visible missing emulsion on one side of the x-rays at the archives, or this is not an authentic uh, first generation copy. And in fact, it's not. 
the emulsion is all there on both sides. So it's a copy film. Okay, next, is the pink area consistent with the flap seen in the Zabruder film? I'm not sure what pink area is being referred to. You're I'm talking about sure Grodin's sure. reconstruction? Uh, not the sure. Temporal bone? The flap was not temporal uh, bone uh, in the Zabruder frames. That was the right side of the skull. Well, it was probably the lateral portion of the temporal bone, if you want to be precise. Okay. Why would someone move the Harper fragment but not remove it from the scene? Well, you have to uh, speculate about human nature here. We have other reports that other bone fragments were picked up in Dealey Plaza that day. We have eyewitnesses who report doing that, and then they drop them after picking them up. So I think this is entirely consistent with human nature. They probably didn't want to be involved. Right. Uh, Next question. Could the picture of the rear of JFK's head, chart number five, be a picture taken after the autopsy when the undertakers had placed a rubber insert on JFK's head to cover the head wound and clean the body? Note there is no blood on the neck or back. Well, if you want to assume that, then you have to explain why that image in seroscopic viewing is 2D. You can't explain that unless okay. the image is the same, absolutely identical in each member of the photographic pair. The reconstruction you described is not consistent with that. Okay, uh, next question. Please further explain why the temple wound does not explain the fragment trail. Well, the temple is just in front of the ear and slightly above. The fragment trail does not begin there. It begins in the anterior hairline, just above the right orbit. They're to totally different anatomic locations. Uh, the, you can't fit the trail with a temporal shot at all. Okay, the next one just has a link to Dr. McClellan on YouTube. and the, the Which is, is a very good thing to look at, by the way. Okay, and, and it would, somebody would just go to YouTube and type in Dr. Robert McClellan. Oh yes, that should pop up quickly. Okay. It's wonderful. Uh, the next question is, uh, wonderful series. Thank you. Nice to see you, David. Could you comment on Sherry Feaster's findings? Well, first of all, can you tell us who she is and then what, or do you want to comment on it? Well, certainly I can. Sherry Feaster has published her own book. Do you remember the name? No. I have uh, blocked block the name of myself. But Sherry Feaster was a forensic expert. She was expert in spatter analysis. And I have written a review of her book as, as well, which you can find at my website, The Mantic View. Uh, I think Sherry got a lot of things right, but she did make some serious mistakes, which you can read about in my review. Okay, I'm looking up her book, uh, Enemy of the Truth, Miss uh, Forensics yes. and the Kennedy Assassination. Yes, that's good. <laughs> Okay, next one. Would you please comment on James Jenkins' talk in Dallas in 2013, for which you took copious notes? This is Doug Horn's question. I might as well disclose that. Especially two things. What he said about the Ida Docs drawing of the photo of the superior brain, parentheses, that it did not look like the brain handed him by Humes. And also... Do you agree with his opinion or judgment that JFK's brain had been removed earlier that evening before Humes handed it to him to infuse in order to remove bullet fragments? Yes, I basically agree with both of those statements from Doug. I think uh, Jenkins' uh, statements were accurately reported by Doug's comment here. Okay. Um, I may have missed something, but at one point in your presentation, this is the question, speaking of Dr. Humes' voice, you might have said he had no knowledge of the Harper fragment. Was it not brought into the morgue that night and fitted into the skull? No, it was not there that night. And Humes uh, never in any document I've seen uh, showed any recognition of the Harper fragment at any time. I don't think the HSCA or the ARRB even brought that to his attention. Okay. Uh, Doug uh, Horn is making a comment. 
The ARRB staff, namely me, consulted with Dr. Mantic about what questions to ask the three pathologists. This is when Doug was working for the, for the ARRB. Dr. Mantic asked us to focus on the large 6.5 millimeter apparent metal fragment in the AP skull x-ray. We did at all of their depositions. None of the pathologists under oath before the ARRB remembered seeing the 6.5 millimeter apparent fragment on the AP film the night of the autopsy. Thanks for helping us out, Doug Horn. Yes, that's absolutely correct. And I added the uh, recollections of John Ebersol, the radiologist. I asked him specifically if there was any large metallic-like fragment on the skull x-ray, and he said, no, there wasn't. But the minute I asked him about the 6.5 millimeter object, he stopped talking forever about the JFK autopsy. All right, next question. Would you please explain in layman's terms, optical density measurement? The device is a very simple one, which you can purchase online. It measures the transmission of light through a very small area. So the device produces its own light source and it measures the transmitted light through the other side of the X-ray film. So if you like, you could report it as a percent transmission, but uh, the optical density measurements are usually done as, done as a logarithmic uh, measurement, not percentages. They can, however, be converted into percentages uh, anytime you wish. So uh, I sampled many such tiny spots on all of the x-rays uh, at the archives, as I showed you in the graphs. Okay, next question. So how many bullets do you believe hit JFK? Well, I suspect the throat wound was caused by a small shard of glass or perhaps a piece of a bullet that uh, ruptured when it hit the windshield. If the latter was true, then there must have been a metal fragment in the throat at some point that day and it must have been removed. So you have to accept that as part of that scenario. But I think the glass shard fragment is a genuine uh, option. And one reason for thinking that is because the autopsy technician noticed two or three tiny holes in JFK's cheek that kept oozing fluid at the autopsy. This, is, this was so much, in fact, that he had to close them. How else could JFK have three tiny holes in his cheek unless it was additional pieces of glass from the windshield that shattered. So the, uh, the, if, it was, if it was a glass fragment that entered the throat, you would never have seen it on the x-ray and you wouldn't be able to find it if you were a pathologist looking for it either. So that seems to me like the most likely scenario. And of course, a small glass fragment would not travel very far either. It would not exit the body. It would stop in the body, perhaps over that large, uh, five centimeter contusion at the top of the lung. Okay. And then, and then you had uh, other shots. Um, the, the back wound was very superficial. The pathologist could never trace any uh, depth at that site. So I think that was a piece of shrapnel. Uh, we have uh, x-ray evidence um, from low energy x-ray scattering that there was metal at that site. In fact, uh, the chemistry analysis showed that it was likely copper. So I think that was probably a small uh, piece of copper that, from a bullet that hit the street first, fragmented, and then a small piece uh, hit JFK in the back. And then you talked about three shots to the head. And three headshots, right. Okay, next question. Are the fractures that appear on the right lateral x-ray located on the anatomical right or left side of the skull? Left I asked, side. Left, left side. side. Okay. Uh, can you say definitively that the neck wound is an entrance wound? Well, I think you just answered that. Well, I, I think all the evidence points toward it being an entrance wound. The single bullet theory is just nonsense. Okay. Uh, Doug Horn, isn't the T-shaped object on the skull x-ray light blue in color indicating it was a scratch? Yeah, the film base uh, tends to be light blue in color. So you're probably seeing the light blue from the film base on, over which the emulsion is prepared when it's manufactured. Okay, do you know, this is a final question. Do you know whether Dr. Wecht agrees with your findings? 
No, I don't. Uh, I have uh, presented many of these arguments to Dr. Weck, but he seems to confine himself to strictly a forensic pathology rather than the broader scope of the issues that I present here. Okay, that wraps up the Q&A. Uh, Dr. Mantic, this has been a really great evening, insightful evening, and uh, I want to thank you again for taking the time to share your insights with us. My pleasure, Jacob. Okay, uh, thank you all for tuning in. That concludes our presentation. Next week, we'll wrap up the heart of the conference, the medical evidence surrounding the autopsy with Dr. Gary Aguilar. So we look forward to seeing you all there. And thank you again for tuning in. And we'll see you next week. Thank you.